Hello everybody and welcome to the Architects Bookshop Isolation Talk number 22. I'm Adam, I'm hoping most of you know me by now, I think most of you are repeat offenders. Um, but tonight, we're, yes, 22nd talk, uh, we have, I've actually disabled the live chat tonight because some of you might have noticed on Tuesday night we had some spam on our live chat which was quite annoying um, halfway through the talk. So if you want to ask a question of Graham Burrows tonight, just maybe direct message me via Instagram and I can um, respond from there. Um, so tonight we have Graham Burrows from Jackson Clements Burrows. Hello, Graham. Adam, hello. How are you? Good. How are things? Things are wonderful. It's a sunny day in Melbourne, in lockdown. In lockdown. Uh, in lockdown, all good, but we're going to get out of a lockdown soon, so that's even better. You are, you are. It's not a bad place, though. You you designed your own house, didn't you? I did. I did design my own house, so it's um, been fantastic. Actually, working extensively in the study that I designed, which I thought I'd be working in mainly in the evenings, but I'm now here all day as well, and it's actually got a lovely window out onto some creepers and trees, so it's um, not a bad place to work. Nice, it's good. Nice. You get to see all the goods and the bads of the house you design. All the good and the bad, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> the, the, the study is south facing, so I do migrate to the northern windows and sit in the sun for a phone call every now and then. Nice. Nice to hear. Nice to hear. So we were just talking offline about how we met and. From memory, you were the year above me at university. I was, absolutely. Those heady days in the early 90s at heady Melbourne days. Uni. When, when, yep. when we thought the third year students were so cool. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Oh, I love it. I love it. But Melbourne University, you were there. Um, Haig Beck was professor, uh, head of school when you were there, yeah? Haig was our head of school, and I, I think inadvertently he was a really strong influence on on certainly me and the way I think about architecture. But interestingly, um, he overlapped with Tim Jackson, one of my partners. Uh, Tim and I were we didn't intersect at Melbourne, but Tim was there at the start of Haig's tenure, and I was there towards the end. Yeah, and I think it's also shaped how how we collectively think a lot about architecture and spaces and placemaking. So um, I think he was pretty influential without realising it at the time. Yeah, absolutely. He's an amazing educator, Haig Beck. He was. He was absolutely brilliant. What was going on at the university then was just absolutely sensational. Yep, absolutely. So, so Jackson Clements Burroughs started off with you and John Clements, the pilot. We love John, the pilot. John, the John. pilot, absolutely. <laughs> he keeps on posting shots of doing loop the loop on his Instagram account. So, uh, it, John John keeps us on our toes. Never yeah. quite know what he's going to do next. Very good. This, you, you met um, working together, yeah? Yeah, we, we met working together as graduates at Daryl Jackson's straight after uni. And that's where we also met Tim. He, he just started his own practice. And uh, I think various lunches and conversations and maybe some late night uh, drink sessions, probably at Myers Place around the corner where James Legg yeah, exactly. uh, set up the, the Six Degrees <laughs> Park. Um, and I think some, some ideas were hatched to, to maybe start our own practice. So uh, naively, we jumped straight in. And uh, Daryl Jackson's office at that time had just finished the SCG, uh, the, sorry, not MCG, Southern State? Yeah, no, it, it had finished the MCG. I actually, one of the first projects I ever worked on was Etihad, uh, well, Dockland Stadium, um, and some of the very early meetings at Dockland Stadium, exploring how you might make a stadium with a roof that slid open and closed. So I, I remember very clearly those sorts of meetings, and it was, being, it was fantastic being involved in... Um, those those level of uh, conversations certainly as a graduate architect it was it was really exciting amazing legacy of work with Daryl Jackson's office you know absolutely phenomenal and uh, I think it's just brilliant that um, the MCG Southern Stand um, got the Enduring Architecture Award at the Victorian Awards this year it's yeah. uh, really fantastic acknowledgement of 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 really probably one of Melbourne's most important civic pieces of architecture yeah um, totally so, agree. yeah totally agree. Um, without further ado, I'll get you to share your slides, but I think for everybody, um, obviously, as I explained, Graham and I met at university. Uh, Graham was in the group of architects at the university whose work we watched, and we were like, oh my God, that's amazing. <laughs> there was a sensational body of uh, work that was going on at that period of time in their, in their year, and it was kind of like, from my point of view at least, um, there's a group of people who you always knew were going to do amazing things uh, and Graham was definitely part of them. So one of the reasons I asked Graham to come and talk tonight was obviously 
I hugely admire um, JCB's work. They're absolutely exceptional outcomes for the city and I think the kind of contribution they make to the city above and beyond the individual building, but the way in which it kind of weaves urban acupunctures is really quite fantastic. But also because um, Graham's in Melbourne, so they're in the lockdown. So what else could you do except to say, yes, I'll do a talk for you. <laughs> so... Absolutely. <laughs> there is a footy final to watch tonight. Well, we'll get we'll be done by then, I think. Hopefully, yeah, absolutely. We'll be done by then. Um, but yeah. so, without further ado, Graham, over to you. Um, Adam, thank you very much. And uh, just as an introduction, um, I'd certainly like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the countries I'm joining you from today and from where our office is situated, the peoples of the Eastern Kulin. Further, I'd like to extend this acknowledgement and pay my respects to the traditional owners and leaders of all the countries where people may be viewing from today. So, um, I've really been thinking of time, mainly because in lockdown at Melbourne at the moment, um, time seems to be standing still. But um, this year really marks the 21st year of JCB. It's our 21st birthday. We started in 1999. And it's certainly a milestone year. Um, well, it's a milestone for most. And, you know, we marked we marked our birthday by moving into a brand new office in Swan Street in Richmond, which, as you can see in this uh, during shot, was a sawtooth factory a warehouse and um, we moved in for eight weeks it was fantastic and then we had to leave due to lockdown one and we've uh, had oh, a sprink tragic. sprinkling of people in there oh. sprinkling sprinkling of people in there um, um, in between lockdown one and lockdown two and now it's it's really empty so it's sitting empty and idle but I think I think the thing about the office and this is in the first week that we moved in it was really about thinking about creating a space of how we'd like to work and how we really optimise the way we work, which is really about collaboration. And I think all the work I'm going to show you tonight is is really the um, the result of some fantastic work from from a whole bunch of people in the office. And even being a partnership, um, Tim and John, uh, from the outset, we've always been about collaboration. So we try to create a space that really fosters co collaboration, really encourages um, pin-up work, um, you know, sharing of ideas. Um, it wants to maximise a sustainable agenda. We have a 53 kilowatt solar farm on our roof. Right now is just pumping an enormous amount of uh, in, um, electricity back into the grid. That's the beauty of a sawtooth roof. It's all wonderfully facing north. Um, but it was also about reaching out and, and, and reaching out to the wider world. And uh, we wanted to hold talks and functions and events here. And uh, this is a this is the one the one talk we managed to have, which was Peggy Dima. Dima from the US who spoke to us about all things equity um, on International Women's Day. And we've really got a warehouse with a shop front onto Swan Street, Richmond, with a car showroom across the road. So in a sense, we're really showcasing architecture and, and what we do. And so um, a lot of aspiration for our office, a lot of um, ambition in terms of how it wants to reflect on how we work. But right now it's hibernating and it's in um, sleeping mode. Um, the computers are all on and, and buzzing away, but um, no one's no one's really there. But being um, being 21 years old, it sort of made me think back to our early projects. And um, this is a little tin shed lean to project we did in McKendrick Lane in um, West Melbourne. And I think our earlier projects often really we had to make the most out of very simple means. And it really made us consciously work hard and think hard about how you distill things down to the essence of the idea. Um, how do you get that sort of reductive clarity into into a project? And I think like all architects, um, our work's really then trying to finally balance, um, you know, the pragmatic with the poetic and how do you deal with things pragmatically and, and intelligently and efficiently solve problems and structural issues and maximise yields, um, but do that in a way that's not boring and at the same time overlay joy and delight without it being too frivolous so it's that fine that fine line and fine balance and i think from the outset um you know working on these leaner projects really instilled quite a strong discipline in us and it's really about getting a coherent response but i think the other thing that we were really interested in doing with our work and always have been is how do we ground our projects in place in their place and how do we respond to our context so that the buildings uh, are not only working for the owners and the occupiers, but but really have a greater engagement with the public realm. Um, you know, what is the civic engagement of a building? Um, how does it positively or negatively or or otherwise impact on on the lives of people who live in and around it? Um, and so. 
this idea of place and, and in a sense it's about an idea of critical regionalism which ties back to some of the the learnings that we did with with Haig Beck sort of ring through and ring strongly in our work so 21 years ago we were doing tin sheds on laneways in Melbourne and uh, 21 years later we're still doing tin sheds um, on inner city laneways in Melbourne um, but the sites have probably grown in size 60 um, 80 square meters to 800 square meters and six staff from our earlier projects to 60 staff um, who are all contributing to the fantastic work that we do. Um, but keeping with this um, idea of time as a framework, I was just looking back at a few projects and thought an interesting way to organise this chat is to talk through a few recent projects across diverse sectors. But interestingly, they span very, very different timeframes from slow, which is a really long project, seven years in the making, South Melbourne Life Saving Club through medium, traditional procurement practices through to fast, which is a temporary village at Monash University and Gillies Hall, a student accommodation project that we've uh, completed for Monash Uni. So I'll use that as a little framework um, for projects that we've worked on since 2012 through to now um, to help guide the talk. So starting off with the South Melbourne Life Saving Club, which was slow, seven years in the making. It started in 2012 early concept design and then sort of came to a grounding a grinding halt in terms of negotiations and disagreements between council city of port phillip the life-saving club engagement with neighbors etc cetera, etc cetera. so it got put on ice for a long time and reignited in 2016 and, and it's only just finished but the site's quite beautiful it's on beaconsfield parade at south melbourne beach and it's on the, the very long linear stretch of um shore uh, for uh, foreshore from St, that leads from st kilda all the way up to port melbourne and I think the thing that struck us when we first went to the site was just A, the sense that you're on the edge of the city, you're on the edge of something, um, but B, it was also just the vastness of the horizon and the vastness of, of, of that landscape. Um, and also there was a very linear quality to, um, to movement patterns on that site. You can see the bike paths of the Bay Trail um, promenading, um, you know, traffic on Beaconsfield Parade and, um, you know, the palm trees, which are really an iconic part of that foreshore. But the previous building was a 1950s building and it was um, really at the end of its life. It was a building that was uh, very poorly sited, created some fairly strong um, congestion and conflict issues here. Uh, it's a building that had a kiosk and very little room for anyone to move around the kiosk. It sort of butted out onto the beach with no real engagement with the beach. Equipment storage was down at 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 at, um, at sand level, which mean in kin tides, a lot of their equipment um, was flooded. And, and very cramped and li limited club spaces and facilities. So I think I think we, we saw this as an opportunity to, to really make, through some simple moves, make um, solve some pretty important fundamental um, urban design and, and civic gestures. And I suppose we can see here the poor siding of the existing building. And we decided to really, in, in demolishing it, create a new platform on the sand that would really liberate the space in front of the building and create a new forecourt and recognise the importance of the width and the generosity of that forecourt. We started to organise the program into sort of more secure spaces, equipment storage and toilets for the life-saving club versus more public spaces, community halls. And then we put a very, very singular flat roof uh, roof plane over it all, capturing all of it as a horizon line, which is really starting to connect back to that landscape. And then popped up some, you know, some sculptural pop-ups to suck in light and cross flow ventilation um, as sort of playful objects that echoed the aquatic activity on the bay. But importantly too, we, we, we in implemented a series of broad timber terraces and we worked very closely with site office landscape architects who are long-term co collaborators of ours to really create a building that was really a veranda for the city and a gateway to South Melbourne Beach. So um, we can see here via these two comparative aerial photographs, um, the siding of the original building and you could see how it pushes back in onto the promenade versus the new facility and the much wider forecourt area and the generation of the forecourt. And so new civic space is generated both on the landward side, but also the terracing coming down to the beach. Um, and so the plan, as I said, which I alluded to earlier, was, was quite simply organised into two core components. Life-saving club on the left-hand side with all their more private functions and, and, and storage on, on the left-hand side and a more flexible community space on the right-hand side, with the club, which the club would use for their training and their, and their 
functions, um, but community groups could use this as well. The local school, Albert Park, Albert Park College, could also use this. So really imagining a building that um, you know, could be used by far more than just the Life Saving Club and the previous club at a very closed um, you know, insular sort of um, way of, of, of addressing the street. And we wanted to open that up and really show off what the club did to the community. So it was a local government project, really lean budget. Um, we had to make the most with, with again, um, simple means. It was about robust materials in a, in a, in a, in a harsh environment. Um, and so very, very simple materials, precast concrete, bluestone, you know, metal cladding, et cetera, et cetera, using paint to generate energy in a, in a low cost way. Um, but then also looking at the site and the ambience and the atmospherics of the site as a series of cues to help us think about light and colour, you know, things like sunsets, mists, um, you know, faded beach towels, sunburns, those little moments of joy and delight that might infuse themselves into the project. Um, and so we can see our section where we, we've kept a low profile building, but then significantly things like the observation room um, pop up. Um, you know, quite dramatically and obviously, so we can all see it and we've painted that, flooded that with a life-saving colour, red, um, um, yellow, sorry. Um, we're getting sunlight into changing rooms and then we come through to the community rooms where the long, low roof profile again has a pop-up, sucking in northern sunlight into, into the community spaces. And you could see how we've really adopted a local vernacular in the form of a veranda to provide shade and protection on both the eastern side and the western side. So really it's about designing with first from first principles and using those first principles to try and generate some really strong sustainable outcomes. And I think we wanted to try and see how you could do as much as possible by just using um, passive systems. So EVE overhangs, cross flow ventilation, but then adding layers like some solar generation. We've got 36 kilowatts of solar panels on the roof, which are powering 100% of the, the building's um, power use, um, rainwater tank, 50% um, recycled content in our in our in our in our concrete, and and raising the level RLs of the building just to be mindful of obviously the raising um, rising sea level uh, sea levels. So you know, trying to trying to make those local government projects work really hard, and not not sort of pro provide an additional cost impost on them in doing that and so we get up to the finished project and here's a fantastic drone view um, that John Gollings took which really gives us the sense of the building, the, the building on the edge of the city and as a gateway uh, to the bay from from for the city of Port Phillip and, and wider Melbourne community. And Graham, how did you, Graham, how did you, get, this how did you get this job? Was it was open it tender? tender? Or? Uh, it was an expression of interest to council and we had recently completed the St Kilda Foreshore Promenade project. Yeah, right. Yeah, right. Um, and so we obviously had a good track record of urban design and public, public space projects um, for the city of Port Phillip. Um, so it was, yeah, again, those local government projects are, are keenly contested, um, but I think we were able to certainly um, demonstrate some of the urban design qualities that we could bring to a response through the promenade work, which I think um, resonated with council. So Absolutely. that was good. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, Anyway, so uh, the building as it sort of presents from the city and then coming down to ground level as it presents from uh, the residence side of Beaconsfield Parade. And, and really, this really sums up the essence of the project to us, that really, really low profile roof line, you know, the little fr frivolous roof pop ups echoing aquatic activity on the bay. Um, and really trying to think about a building that's highly transparent um, and so we can see through it and and, and invite people down um, onto the beach. And it really has uh, over time become a real gateway down to, down to that beach. So we could see now coming across the expanded forecourt area, um, which fantastically allows people to arrive, um, orientate a new kiosk, which is well off the bike path. So we have none of the clashes that were happening. And starting to sort of wander through, we can start to see the veranda edges. And again, speaking about that connection to place, looking at the local vernacular, you could see this building over here with the beautiful verandas about it. And so how we can pick up on what was done 80, 100 years ago and, and done for very sensible environmental means and ad adapt that for our building um, to create an edge and a threshold. And once we're in under the century veranda, we can look back to the city and connect back to the um, uh, the, 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 the near suburbs. Um, here's Albert Park College just in the distance, which, as I said, does use the space as, as one of the um, one of the tenants. 
And then we tumble down onto these terraces, which was such an important part of the project. And and it's it's important to say that the, the veranda and the terraces were the unbriefed part of the project. It, this, this was never imagined by council. Um, but these spaces we saw as being so important in terms of unlocking the relationship between the building and the local community. And in terms of putting the, the Life Saving Club community activities down in this glass box. And so people could see um, CPR training happening, engage with what the Life Saving Club does and try and sort of um, you know, generate more interest in inquiry. So inside these rooms, you could see how it looks back to how it looks back to the city, but it also looks onto this veranda and, and um, volleyball courts to the south. So it really was about um, trying to find as many strong um, connections to activities happening around it to ensure that the building um, uh, was visible and, and engaging in a positive way. Um, inside the community room, we could see the strength of the horizon line, but also the punch of yellow as our roof flicks up and sucks northern light into the, um, into the community spaces. Speaking of yellow, the observation room um, with a fantastically sunny knot Melbourne day out the window. Um, but our uh, our lifesavers are uh, hard at work there. And again, we wanted that iconic life-saving yellow, making it a readily identifiable space. Whereas the changing rooms, we've maybe got a bit of a, a sunburny flesh colour, um, you know, how you feel at the end of a long day, but little moments of joy um, um, in, in what is, again, a fairly robust, simple building storage of the boards um, and then coming out to the building on a summer's afternoon in Melbourne and you know the, the, the new forecourt actively engaging with the public, the kiosk, you know, avoiding any of the conflicts that previously used to happen and then turning around and actually seeing our way down onto the beach and seeing how the building functions as an entry gateway and a portal down to the beach. And it's just beautiful watching how people colonise these terraces and, and, and are comfortable sunbathing on the terraces, um, reading, waiting for friends. Um, and they, they really are filling all of the purposes that we, we imagined they would. And I, I love this photo because we've even got a TV news crew um, who are actually doing a report from the veranda. Awesome, so awesome. the building as it presents from the beach has got news crews, it's got people arriving at the beach and all the parents watching the, the, the nipper training activity happening um, happening on the beach. Peel and Oxford, a multi-residential project in Collingwood, um, which is in industrial Collingwood heartland. Um, and it's a project where our clients bought this site. There was a permit previously for a four-storey um, building on it. And they came to us with ambitions to do a really sustainable uh, multi-residential project. Um, our clients were small giants who co-developed the commons with Jeremy um, before he did the Nightingale projects. And so we um, we sort of uh, were pretty excited to get involved in this project. But interestingly, it, it sort of referenced some work we did in early 2000s, the Beardo Apartments, where we, we created an apartment building with open air walkways allowing for cross flow ventilation and the staircase acting as a thermal chimney and it's interesting if we look back at that work that we were doing in the early 2000s retrospectively it feels quite radical in the context of um where we were um starting to look at this project so we, we took the traditional double loaded corridor apartment project apartment type and pulled it apart to create those open air corridors and circulation which is really so fantastic for an apartment building because it allows lighting to the common areas and circulation. It allows for cross flow ventilation. It allows for vegetation to grow up through the common areas. But most importantly, it really allows for visual and social connectivity and the idea of generating a community within the building. Um, and this is one of the really exciting things about this project and, and to that end, all projects that are working in this way. And I saw James Legg presented a similar project last uh, last week. Um, and so, you know, we, we were excited to start exploring this and we were also highly mindful of our context. And so we broke down the massing of the building to pick up on the elements of the context and certainly these large brick warehouses, but start to playfully stagger the heights. So we transitioned um, from our Oxford Street facade down to our Peel Street facade in a, in a, in a, in a rhythmic and a, and a, and a, and a sensitive way. Um, the plan, as we can see with the open air walkways, um, allowed for really good one bedders with cross flow ventilation, two bedders on the corners. Um, but more importantly, the idea of socialisation um, between between the apartments. And as the building finished and presented from the, the Peel Street Park across the way, we can see how it's sort of really 
sort of simply embeds itself in this built form context and environment and, and does it in a way that picks up on the cues of the buildings around it, but adds the layer of occupation and solar control through the use of the shutters. So we're getting activity. Oh, my daughter's giving me a message saying my speaker isn't working. I think she's, I think she's, um, yeah, behind oh, on that, that one. We're back working again. So yeah, we're, we're back working. working. Excellent. <laughs> um, <laughs> so the activity um, and the occupation uh, really animating the facade. Um, and here we can see as we've turned the corner coming down on Peel Street. But the common areas <clears throat> and the circulation are such fantastic spaces in this building and it really allows you on level three to know your neighbour on level one. And I've noticed being in this building, that level of engagement and interaction between the residents is just wonderful. Um, you know, air, uh, it, light and air starting to sort of find its way down into the ravine and looking back through the ravine. And, and, and a former uh, employee of JCB lived in this apartment. He told me how he used to sort of sit and take a, have, have his morning coffee out on the veranda and get the morning sun on the veranda um, and then go across onto the western side for the afternoon sun. So people start to occupy and use these uh, circulation spaces, which is a really fantastic way to build community um, within these buildings. Simple, sensitive interiors. And I think one of the other things that's been interesting on this project is watching how people own and occupy the space and start to really furnish things in their own way. One, one person came in and painted every room a different color. One was pink, one was green, one was blue, and it com completely transformed the space. And I think it's an interesting thing when you're doing multi-residential work, realizing that people will want to take a degree of ownership and occupation of their spaces. Um, I love the shot just showing, I suppose, <clears throat> the gentle play that the, the shutters start to introduced to the facade um, as opposed to the robustness of the original Collingwood warehouses and of course roof terraces um, where people can come together as a community within the building with fantastic views back to the city um, as well and um, just zooming back out to the street level where we've inserted a new building that really sits very comfortably in this context it's not screaming and shouting it's not it's not trying to draw too much attention to itself but it just very gently gives back to the public realm um, you know much like you know the buildings do in, in when you walk around milan where you've got building after building that's just simple and well considered and well generated um, all all adding to a really rich and and, and vibrant um, you know Street, streetscape environment but at the same time in terms of working with context working on projects like this with with built form as a generator we were also doing projects like the avery apartments in in hawthorne you know our melbourne's garden suburbs and how do you introduce apartment buildings into into green leafy environments and the solution here was to grow as much of green all over the building as possible so landscape became the, the strong contextual generator and then balconies and, and verandas became lanterns almost tree houses in the landscape um, and the, the the client who actually developed his own house property you know created a, a penthouse for himself on the rooftop that really opened and closed and engaged with the atmosphere as well so really interesting to see how <clears throat> we're trying to uh, i suppose respond to contexts in in um, two very different contexts and produce two, two very different built form responses another medium scale Scale uh, time frame project was at Elba Park College, um, which was a liberal arts campus in Pickle Street. Six Degrees had just recently completed a fantastic campus for the Year Nines and Year Nines at Bay Street, and Dank Street is their um, is their main campus. So it's a highly mobile campus, and the kids are walking to and from these different different facilities. And the site itself was actually a 100-year-old school template building. There were 20 of these that were built around the state. And it was a beautiful building, but it was in a state of really terrible disrepair um, and amazing internal spaces and volumes, but really painted, um, you know, education department grey with grey filing cabinets and not much joy inside them at all. Um, uh, the thing that distinguished this site, though, was the landscape context. And you had this beautiful, beautiful building, but surrounded by a, a series of really fantastic trees. And so understanding when we were adding to the brief where the, where the root zones were was particularly important. And the project was sort of adding three new classrooms um, around the perimeter, <clears throat> reinstating the, 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 um, the classrooms in the main building. Um, and I suppose reinvigorating the central heart of the building as a, as, a, as, a, as a central learning space. And again, we worked with site office landscape architects who um, started to develop a really fantastic um, uh, landscape response to this project where the elevated decks kept us off the, off, off the landscape. Um, the land was contaminated. We were near the Gasworks Park um, and allowed us to circulate um, gently between the new pavilions and the, um, 
the original school building and then they planted some really fantastic native plantings all through the rest of the site. A lot of work in, in re, um, you know, reinvigorating the original building. Um, but really, we've we've come up uh, with with a solution that's really a vibrant and a mature new campus, and we're working with a fantastic headmaster from Albert Park College, Steve Cook, whose whose driving ethos was let's make it beautiful, let's inspire the kids. It was a really wonderful um, stakeholder to work with, um, and making the central space a collective learning space that the students could use as a reading room. And we really looked at the great reading rooms of Europe and painted it that sort of um, aqua green colour. Um, to help sort of create a mature learning based environment, but this is a space that's also used for functions in the evenings. So quite a quite a lovely series of spaces and then re um, repurposing the old classrooms and in their own right, they were absolutely wonderful spaces with light and volume and aspect, you know, um, blackboards and fireplaces uh, that, that are actually used as, as part of the um, you know, part of the heating system, not not very PC from an environmental perspective, but the ambience is beautiful. Another layer in this project um, that was wonderful was um, the, the canteen, which actually became more like a kitchen that you'd, you'd visit um, and sit in. And we worked with Ben Shuriri uh, from Attica Restaurant, whose kids were actually at the school, and he really talked through ideas around um, the menu and, and how they could use local ingredients and keep a very simple um, offer on for the kids. And so really fantastic processes working through uh, to create this project. Um, the new classrooms, um, which were really used as yoga studios before school and parent uh, parent collaboration spaces after school, so getting the most out of the spaces as well. And then trying to think about um, the spaces in between and much like um, <clears throat> the South Melbourne Life Saving Club, the veranda is an un unbriefed space, but a space that actually allowed two classes to collapse into a protected space and give the school more flexibility um, and, and, and more spaces to do things in. And all the time being really conscious of our connection to the neighbourhood and the streets around us. And so looking out to the, to the streets, but also looking back in and ensuring that there's a porosity and a connectivity between the activities of the school um, and, the, and the broader community. Um, and here you can see the shaping and the forming of the new pavilions to pick up on the um, on the landscape context. And we really used this, the, the the hips and the gables of the original building, but but stained these these buildings in dark black um, timber to really nestle in the shadows, in and amongst the trees, playing with ideas of where the where the fence light might want to run um, to protect enclaves where the students could get together. Another big part of the project um, was Steve's idea of engaging with the local <clears throat> Indigenous community and um, he wanted to create a, a, a talking circle and he had connections with the local community and try to create a place that that anyone could come and get together and talk and have um, have functions and so it's used by the school but it's used by the wider community as well and here we can see a smoking ceremony at the at the start of the um, opening of the campus for the use of the space. Um, and here it is as part of the entry to the building and students using that talking circle as part of their lunchtime activities. And just coming back to the um, to, 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 to a view in the evening because it is an evening campus as well as a daytime campus and a warm and a welcoming series of new pavilions, which really are domestic in scale. Um, and we wanted to create a response that was about landscape in an urban environment and, and one that had a sort of a domestic um, clarity to it. And again, it sort of picked up on some other work we were doing in the area in terms of houses in York Street and Harold Street engaging with this heritage, um, with a heritage context in new and sculptural ways. So um, yeah, a project that was really enjoyable to work with. So under fast and fast tracking processes, um, Monash Village. So we were doing work with Monash University um, through all of this and they came to us saying that they needed to create a decanting campus for Monash College um, to occupy a campus, a temporary campus to occupy about 2,000 students. And, and, and currently there are some portables on site at Monash that they were using, which are really substandard and they feel like um, builder site sheds. And they identified this car park on the south, the southeastern corner of the site as the, um, the, the, the site for this new campus. And looking at the original portables that are used, um, you know, they were pretty bleak and Monash wanted to build them fast. Um, but um, the college saw an opportunity to create a vibrant environment for the students. And Monash College is, is really a, a bridge into Monash University. And a lot of overseas students come here and learn English, learn English 
um, as a sort of a bridging a bridging course uh, to university. And so um, the college really wanted this to have the energy and the intensity of, of, of a Shanghai laneway. Um, but at the same time, we were interested in celebrating, I suppose, the temporary nature of the buildings, recognising that they could be pulled down at any point in time. And so it was this fusion of, of, of sort of erratic streetscapes and, and energy with, um, with, with a Meccano set uh, temporary assembly. And this all had to be done in six months. So we started the project in March 2015 and handed it over in September 2015, which meant we had to engage with off-site modular construction. So it made us really rethink our timelines and our processes and how we did work. Um, early works were just about understanding what fitted on the site and, and, and how you did it in a rational or pragmatic way or a completely loose loose form way. And I think where we landed was was a plan that mediated between the two where the actual layout of the modules um, you know, respected the contours of the site but also created a fantastic eastern courtyard and a western courtyard as more sheltered or closed down spaces. And part of the brief was, was how could the students learn outside of the classrooms as well? And so whilst we have traditional classrooms here, can we use these outdoor, outdoors places as classrooms? Can we bump into each other in the corridors and actually meet and exchange ideas? So we took the approach of, of really making the, 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 the portables read as portables um, and design them in a way that they could be demounted and relocated by Monash at any point in time. To, to that extent, we didn't even puncture the car park. We, we, we tried to um, ensure minimal interruptions to the car park. And then adding a whole gantry set, um, system of walkways um, that were like a Meccano set. We actually wanted to do it out of scaffolding in the early days, but um, the structural engineers wouldn't let us do that. Um, and then add a third layer of landscape and keeping with this idea of the artificial, you know, layering blue astroturf over the car park, you know, hyper colourful, but hyper not real, but, you know, hopefully fun. And here's some sequence, construction sequence shots of the portables um, being fabricated off site and being hoisted into site. And then the stick build um, of all the gantries and the walkways happening at the same time. And so this, this really was about understanding overlapping processes, getting the portable documentation done early, then working through the shop drawings of the steelwork, um, but really resulting in what feels like quite an intricate series of spaces and, and buildings, um, which are graphic and fun and un unapologetically graphic um, using a tensile, stretch tensile fabric over the top um, of the walkways and the canopies, which really glows in the light. We're particularly proud of the fact that we managed to convince the Melbourne Fire Brigade to allow the fire hose reel to be painted yellow in keeping with this um, um, this yellow theme running through the buildings. Um, and it's really about the circulation, the walkways providing the energy, fibre cement sheet floors, um, you know, powder coated steelwork and coming upstairs, the coating of the buildings, you know, block D, block E. Um, and internal spaces, um, which really were far superior to the in internal spaces that we that were using in the previous portables, high acoustic ratings, um, collaboration spaces, individual group spaces um, using laminate joinery. So a cost conscious project again, but trying to create a variety of opportunities and spaces of learning for the kids. So we finished stage one um, in six months. We were exhausted. And about a year later, they said we want to do stage two. So we'd already master planned a potential stage two addition, which clipped on to the, to the southern edge. And that allowed us to implement some further refinements, including integrated bench seating, which came out of um, um, some feedback on, on, on stage one, which was great. Um, but overall, really, it's a campus that's got a lot of fun. It, it, it has, well, it doesn't have right now. It had the capacity for 2,000 students to be on it. But through this process, Monash University started to see the value of this investment and they saw how they could actually use this as a decanting tool for all other, all sorts of other faculties if they were doing new building works for other faculties. So I think over time, there was a huge amount of buy-in from Monash University in terms of the ambitions of this project, making it more than just a, a site share portable village um, and turning it into a, a, a mini city and a mini campus in its own right with indoor and outdoor learning opportunities as well. And so here we can see how the progress, how the project progressed from a car park to a stage one to stage two, which was almost like some alien creature landing on, on that car park, but in a fun and a vibrant and joyous way. So um, who knows how long that'll be here, but um, it's um, it's a it's a pretty fun little project which was over in a in, in a blink of an eye. 
but that's led on to other modular work. And so we took our learnings from that. And here's a, here's a project that's recently got installed in Merijik at the, at the base of, of Mount Buller, or sorry, Mansfield at the base of, of Mount, Mount Buller. Um, and this was installed in, in three or four hours overnight. Um, and so we get to shoot this properly. But, you know, I think the important thing when you consider that, that the evolution of a practice over time is how projects inform and involve um, and in, evolve and inform other, you know, subsequent project work, which leads me to um, Gillies Hall, our Monash student housing project, which um, is, um, you know, another fascinating project. And this was fast and it was a really ambitious project for Monash University. Um, one which was really aligned with their commitment to for 2030 net zero carbon targets and it's it's currently the largest project that combines mass timber construction and passive house certification in the country um, it also really accords to monash university's uh, pastoral care model where they really try to create fantastic learning sleeping and collaborating spaces for their students um, and socialization spaces um, but the thing about this project is we had to generate 150 student rooms, um, attempt passive house certification and explore mass timber construction all in 19 months to be open for students in 19 months. So this was a wild journey and, and hats off to our team that worked on this project led by Simon Topless, who who really um, they came up with some fantastic um, work in a very short time frame. Um, looking at the master plan that the master plan had been been prepared for the campus by Lyons and glass urban and we were really the first residential project on the eastern edge of the campus that was um, going to sort of establish a framework for new residential accommodation and the, the campus on monash at monash peninsula is really beautiful it's a bush campus it opened in 1959 as a, as a teacher's college um, and it's really evolved into the beautiful bush campus our site, however, wasn't quite as beautiful. And as you can see, it's a sort of pretty barren car park on the eastern edge of the campus. A whole lot of issues to deal with. Um, the edges dealing with neighbours and resident residences on one edge, um, very stark, uh, very steep embankments on others. How we would feed into a network of walkways and pathways as part of the um, master plan, and also acknowledging a pretty a pretty significant um, overland flood path um, along along the western edge of our site. Um, from a basic architectural and planning point of view, we, we took the typical double loaded corridor student accommodation type that we'd actually completed recently uh, previously at Monash University and broke it apart and tried to orientate these two wings in ways that actually improve their solar orientation and minimise their impact to the neighbours. We further cleaved them apart so we could get cross flow ventilation and common areas on each level. Um, and really acknowledge that the vertical circulation through the core of the building was really the heart of the way this um, this facility worked. Um, you know, co major common areas on the ground plane, and we had to be highly mindful of wrapping the facade with shade and shelter, which I'll talk about in due course. Um, I won't sit on that plan. Um, but talking about the plan, as I suggested, at, at, at ground floor, a lot of the primary student um, collaboration spaces, um, play spaces, learning spaces, gaming rooms, music rooms, big common areas, along with college heads and deputy heads on the ground floor. But coming up at typical level, we had 30 kids on every level, 15, uh, 15 beds on each wing. Uh, but importantly, the kitchen was, was, was in the foyer in the lobby. And part of the Monash model is that you can't go back to your room without trying to force or encourage interaction with other students. So it's really about encouraging so, um, socialization around this knuckle in the middle of the building. Um, and it's worked fantastically. Similar to um, similar to uh, the Monash Village project, we also had to deal with a whole new language, which was which was fast track delivery of a project in CLT and, and mass timber. And that means we had to get a builder on board incredibly early. We had to do design development and then um, procure our cross laminated timber before we'd really documented huge other swathes of the building. So it was a bit of a hair rising, hair raising journey. Um, um, Multiplex and, and Simon from our team went over went over to Europe, visited um, CLT factories and plants, did study, um, did, did visits to other student housing projects in Norway, had a bit of fun on the way. Um, but it was really a huge learning curve with this pressure of this 19 month deadline behind it all. Um, but what really resulted was a building that was really a concrete platform on the ground floor. And while that was being built, all the all the CLT, all the all the you know, timber panel componentry was being assembled and shipped off site. And then it came to site and 
basically stacked one on top of each other very, very quickly. And so we really had a simple timber box of five levels on top of a concrete plinth. But, you know, allied to that was this passive house journey. And really passive house is really about trying to create highly comfortable, thermally efficient buildings that use really, really um, minimal energy and create wonderful internal environments. And they rely on on, on, on well-designed, well-insulated in facades, heat recovery systems. Um, and it requires a different way to think about how you put your buildings together. It was really about airtight, airtight perimeters. And so our team had to learn a whole new language um, in this fast track journey. Um, the actual timber structure, the, the CLT structure is wonderful in the sense it, it's an insulator in its own right. But then we had to really avoid thermal bridging. So we couldn't get any heat transfer from the external facade through to the internal um, fabric of the building. And then being in the Southern hemisphere, we had to be highly mindful of the heat gains rather than the heat losses um, that might happen within the, within the project. It looked very different on site. Um, not like many site, sites that we're used to, taping between all the panels, all the screw fixings, insulation, and just being on a site where we've got mass panels of timber being lifted on a regular basis. And these are prefabricated bathroom modules that also got hoisted in on site as well. So a huge learning curve for ourselves and the builders. Um, and at the same time, a hell of a lot of modelling. Um, and ACOM had to model the environmental performance of the building. And really, with uh, with the objectives of this passive house environment, we, we we had a bandwidth of 20 degrees to 30 degrees for the ambient temperature of the rooms to um, to, to operate within, without the use of any heaters. Um, and what was achieved was pretty much bang on the modelling. And what we found is the heat output that was coming out of the fridge in every student's room was actually um, enough to heat the room. Um, and so the building really performs as modelled, which is absolutely fantastic because this is, uh, you know, that was that was the you know, the major challenge and risk with this project. We've got a few um, anomalies in, in the data. This is when someone took a temperature sensor home and left it in the boot of their car in this weekend in April. So that that's not a real reading. <laughs> But the other thing that's also interesting is this period over here where, where the temperature just dips below the 20 degree mark is when 80% of the students went back overseas um, for, 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 for university holidays. And so we realise you actually need the student body in there and occupying the spaces to help maintain that temperature band. So, you know, an interesting learning is, is thinking how the occupants are also impacting on the performance of the building. But by and large, it's, it's performed fantastically. Um, as I mentioned, part of this was actually understanding the challenges of, of reaching passive house certification in the summer, southern hemisphere or in Melbourne's climate where heat gain is almost more of an issue. And this is a heat model of the facade without any shading versus the impact of shading on the facade. So you can see how significant it was, which really led us into a narrative for the facade of the buildings. Um, and again, trying to bed the building back in its context. <clears throat> the red brick and the and and the, and the banks ears and the and the bottle brush um, of the local context and the eucalypt and the coastal environment you know giving us some, some cues of for colors for this facade but making the facade sort of you know rich and joyous and almost like abstract foliage um, of the facade as well so it's a really important part of the building and one which really nestles in behind the hills as you sort of walk up to the campus from um, from various uh, up, up to the facility from various um, walkways in the campus um, just looking into that facade and some of the the solar protection and the different shadows we're getting on the facade at different times of the day as well. So quite an animated um, and abstract um, upper level facade, which generated some really beautiful shadows at the ground plane as well. Um, the building was called Gillies Hall. It was named after Max Gillies, who actually studied on that campus in the late 50s and early 60s. I think he was very proud to have a building named after him. Um, but coming inside, the, the the real sort of warmth of that timber 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 environment is revealed, and you know timber linings to walls, acoustic ceilings, but even using offcuts from the cross laminated timber panels um, as furniture um, in our walkways. Um, yeah, corridors connecting um, the entry to student spaces and student playrooms, um, gaming spaces, learning spaces beyond stained plywood. So a really warm, soft environment, one that's a very calm, nurturing environment. Um, here's the collaborative, um, you know, you know, the communal spaces on the ground floor where everyone can get together and, and broader functions for the whole building could be held. But coming up the building, I spoke about this early, earlier, the idea of the, the, the kitchen almost being in the lobby, 
lift calls just around the corner. So you you will interact with and bypass people all the time. Um, the other thing that was also important was trying to sort of encourage circulation and, and see circulation between the levels. So we actually managed to get a glass wall on our fast there so we can see people coming up and down the staircases too. But from inside this um, foyer and this lobby, looking out to the facade and the bush campus beyond. Um, the, stu the study spaces, which are also dining spaces, which are, are, are sort of a, a room sealed off uh, from the kitchen so we can see it from the kitchen, but we can keep it but private and, and quiet as well. And then coming into that staircase where you can see the importance of connectivity between the levels and really encouraging um, you know, interaction for the student body um, on a level by level basis. Yeah. Using large pieces of structural timber to really form our staircases. So it's raw, it's structural, smells a bit like a sauna. It feels wonderful to be in. Um, it's a whole new language for us. Um, and at the same time, looking at the rooms and looking at how we could take that colour palette uh, that we'd extracted from the natural environment and, and infuse some personality and individuality into each of the rooms. And again, simple detailing, reflecting um, the robustness and the simplicity of the, of the timber, um, the timber panelling as well. And we were able to reveal in every student room one wall and an external facade of CLT while we had a plaster lined wall on the other side where, where we could run services. So that was a great accomplishment well and it really fundamentally feels um, like a warm and a comforting environment with an integrated bench street, bench seat for all the students to use. Certainly, it's a project um, you know that we're immensely proud of, and it's a project that's that's doing some fantastic things from a sustainability point of view. Um, some of the data and statistics around this job's quite incredible. Um, it's it's really resulted in about a thousand less tons of carbon being pushed into the atmosphere than if we built this as a as a business as usual concrete type of building. Um, it's running uh, anywhere between sixty to eighty percent more efficiently than than a standard building. So for long for, for Monash University. University, who's a long-term owner of an asset like this, um, year-on-year savings are just going to going to compound. Uh, but the renewability of the timber is quite amazing, and there are 1,800 cubic metres of timber in this building. Which, if you look at the growth rate of Australia's um, plantation forests, which is 30 cubic metres a minute, the volume of timber in this building effectively regrows itself in four and a half hours. And so it's amazing to think of of, of moving into buildings that are that are being able to be regenerated. So um, a fantastically exciting um, project to be part of, and one that's really sort of set us on 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 a new journey. Um, and our work for Monash has sort of led to um, a new project that we are just completing at La Trobe University: um, 624 beds in two buildings, which is also cross laminated timber um, with prefabricated modular facade systems. This project is literally just just received uh, practical completion. And so we've taken all of our learnings from Gillies Hall and they, we've brought them here to the um, the Trobe project, um, getting even more ambitious with the communal spaces, um, looking at the, fa uh, the facade and how it sort of shades, um, shades our rooms, but it really creates uh, wonderfully engaging spaces as well. So that's been a fantastic uh, follow-up project. But probably even more interestingly for us is, is a new school project we're doing for the Victorian School Building Authority, um, where we're trying to combine um, mass timber construction with passive house certification. And the implications of a project like this are fantastic. If um, the modelling for this building is projecting that a $40,000 energy bill is going to reduce down to $4,000 a year um, because of the thermal performance of the building. Um, and if you think about the quantum of work that's been done by the Victorian School Building Authority, which is building hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars worth of work every year, if they applied these sorts of principles to a lot of their work, imagine the huge energy savings year on year that we can start to generate. So, um, yeah, we're really excited to see how this project comes together. We're just currently in the middle of um, preparing some tender, uh, some tender documents on that. Which leads me to my last slide, which um, is another sort of layer to the practice that's part of a new journey for us. And, um, you know, we are um, really excited to have Sarah Lynn Rees on, on board with us, who's an Indigenous architect, and she's really helped us in terms of, I uh, suppose, um, 
being more aware of our own responsibilities to country and sort of engagement with traditional owners. And, um, you know, we've, um, we've started a journey as a practice of, uh, of, of really trying to engage um, with traditional owners, certainly on public projects. And it's something we're, we're, we're taking our first steps in and it's something that we're obviously going to make mistakes along the way, but try and do more and more of. Um, but Sarah consults for other practices as well, because it's so important that, um, you know, we're all starting to engage um, with traditional owners on, on, on projects. And so she's working with a range of different practices on, on, on various projects around a town. Um, but it's sort of led to new new projects for us, and um, we're looking at three projects at the moment. One is a, a cultural camp. This is um, up at Lake Mungo, um, an amazing landscape. Um, we're doing some early work over there. Um, we're looking at a cultural landscape project um, in Melbourne CBD by the banks of the Yarra and also an exhibition. So it's feeling like, you know, we've just turned 21. Um, we've sort of hit this point in space and time, and we're sort of embarking on new journeys, and hopefully we can do it in our new office in, in the new future with a whole new series of collaborations and a whole new sort of series of ambitions going forward.